Hi friends, in this video I will talk about a approach to a case of CS of rhinorrhea which is a serious warning sign. First is the disclaimer. CSF rhinorrhea is drainage or leakage of CSF through the nostril and at times through the ears. CSF leak can be dangerous as it reduces the protective cushion, increases the risk of brain injury and affects the blood flow. It may also indicate a skull fracture especially in the frontobasilar or temporal region and if it is not treated properly or prompt evaluation is not done, it may create a direct pathway for infections like meningitis. So the prompt evaluation and management is very essential in a case of CSF rhinorrhea. Just uh, a few words about the CSF. It is a clear colorless liquid that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord. It is mostly water that is 99% with a small amount of electrolytes, proteins, neurotransmitters and glucose. It is mainly produced by the choroid plexus in the brain's ventricles, circulates through the central nervous system and reabsorbed from the reabsorbed into the bloodstream through the arachnoid granulations. The total CSF volume in an adult is about 150 ml with daily production and reabsorption of 420 to 530 ml. It mainly cushions the brain and the spinal cord and regulates the temperature and helps in removing the waste products. A CSF leak occurs when there is a tear in the dura mater allowing the fluid to escape into the epidural space or externally and this can cause low pressure headaches, neck pain, neck pain ear ringings and sometimes loss of smell or taste. A leak that is CSF leak reduces the brain cushioning and it affects the blood flow and increases the risk of direct trauma and life threatening infections like meningitis. Coming to the etiology of the CSF rhinorrhea, the causes of CSF leak can be traumatic. It is seen in 80% of the cases, most common due to craniofacial injuries. Iotrogenic causes contribute about 16% and they are usually after surgeries like sinus procedure, pituitary surgery, lumbar punctures or spinal anesthesia. Spontaneous CSF leaks is seen only in 4% of the cases and it occurs without a clear cause and it is often linked to low or high intracranial pressures, dural weakness and connective tissue disorders. Types of CSF leaks, skull base leaks and spinal leaks. Skull base leaks they are seen in fractures of the cribriform plate, ethmoid, sphenoid sinuses or temporal bones and it leads to CSF rhinorrhea that is nasal leak or otorrhea that is ear leak. Spinal leaks often are spontaneous or post procedural. They lead to low intracranial pressure symptoms like headache, dizziness and nausea. In few special cases, spontaneous spinal CSF leak can be due to dural tears, meningeal diverticula, CSF venous fistula, or uh, idiopathic causes can be there. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension can also lead to CSF leak due to increased pressure eroding the skull base areas. Why this CSF leak matters? Because if it is not evaluated and managed timely, it can lead to meningitis due to the open communication with external environment. Loss of CSF cushioning can affect the brain function and increase the trauma risk. Common sites of CSF leak. The most common site is the cribriform plate. Sphenoid and ethmoid sinuses are also there but they are the rare, rare causes and other causes or other sites for the CSF leaks are frontal sinuses which result part of temporal bone. Knowing the site of the CSF leak helps in early diagnosis and management. Coming to the epidemiology, I have, as I have already discussed the causes of the C, uh, CSF leak. Spontaneous CSF leaks usually present between 
33 to 52 years of age. They are most common at the upper thoracic spine that is T1 to T6 followed by the lower thoracic spine that is T7 to T12. Lumbar and cervical spine leaks are less common. CSF leaks uh, after surgery, the primary surgery accounts for 5.5 to 9% risk of CSF leak and but the secondary surgeries they have higher risk. For endoscopic skull based surgeries like that for pituitary or others, the CSF leak rates is 10.1% and it is often influenced by the closure techniques and the material used. Coming to the pathophysiology, the skull based CSF leaks, they do not typically cause orthostatic headaches. They are often associated with high CSF pressure rather than low. The common causes are head trauma, surgery or spontaneous leaks and this skull based CSF leaks they leads to CSF rhinorrhea due to breach in the mucosa, bone or dura or the arachnoid. Spinal CSF leaks they are because of low CSF pressure or they lead to low CSF pressure and patient has orthostatic headaches. It occurs by three main mechanisms that is the mechanism of the CSF uh, spinal CSF leaks is meningeal diverticula. Meningeal diverticula is weak spots in the dura which allows the leptomeninges to protrude. It can cause slow or rapid CSF leak which is worsened by Valsalva maneuvers. Second cause is the second mechanism is the ventral dural tears which are caused by sharp bony structures for example calcified disc or osteophytes they result in a rapid CSF leak and large epidural CSF collections. CSF venous fistula these are the abnormal direct connection between the CSF and the paraspinal veins they lead to continuous unregulated CSF loss which leads to intracranial hypotension most commonly in the thoracic spines. So key takeaways are skull based leaks, they are because of high CSF pressure, patient presence with CSF rhinorrhea and there are no orthostatic headaches. Spinal leaks, they cause low CSF pressure, they cause orthostatic headaches, they may occur by diverticular, dural tear or CNS venous fistulas. So, Evaluation of CSF rhinorrhea is very important. In history, most CSF leaks they point towards uh, trauma or surgery. We should always ask the patient about recent head or spine trauma or surgery, whether patient has a clear nasal or ear discharge. We have to ask him about headaches, neck, neck pain, stiffness, skull based CSF leaks. Patient may mostly has clean rhinorrhea that is CSF dripping from the nose. This is very clean. Patient may also present with headache, neck pain, stiffness and uh, the rare symptoms due to brain herniations may be quadriparesis, coma, infarcts or galactoria. Spinal CSF leaks uh, they, are, they contribute to spontaneous intracranial hypotension. The hallmark symptom is orthostatic headache which worsen when standing and it is relieved by lying down. Some cases may have chronic non-positional headaches. Other common symptoms of spinal CSF leaks are nausea, dizziness, tinnitus, neck pain, st stiffness, memory problems, ataxia, Parkinsonism like symptoms, superficial sidrosis due to low bleeding, slow bleeding from the dural effects. Sp when, whenever there is spinal cord involvement, patient may have radiculopathy, brachial amyotrophy, myelopathy. So the key takeaways are we should always suspect CSF leak in any patient with clear nasal or ear discharge and recent history of trauma or surgery to the
three surgical orthostatic headaches they may suggest a spinal csf leak that is spontaneous intracranial hypotension and the chronic cases may present with neurological symptoms including the memory loss ataxia and the myelopathy how to evaluate the csf leaks first we have to confirm the diagnosis the gold standard test is beta 2 transferrin test it is found only as we know that beta 2 transferrin is found only in csf and perilymph it is highly specific and sensitive if positive it converts uh, confirms a csf leak if negative csf leak is unlikely initially we used to do glucose testing uh, testing but this is unreliable and is no longer recommended whenever we have confirmed the diagnosis of csf leak we have to categorize it as early onset delayed onset late onset earlier onset is when it occurs within 2 days of trauma delayed onset after 1 week after trauma and late onset up to 3 months after trauma the occult leaks may present as a recurrent post traumatic meningitis without any active csf drainage thereafter we have to do the imaging to identify the site of the csf leak the first line test is the high resolution ct it detects a skull base or temporal bone defects if there are multiple defects are suspected we can do ct cystinography and it uses the contrast to localize the leak if meningo encephalocele is suspected the mr cystinography it is a best for soft tissue assessment for intermittent risk hrct is done first then we can do contrast mr cystinography or radionucleotide cystinography if needed there are some uh, special concentra- considerations spontaneous csf rhinorrhea it is often linked to idiopathic intracranial hypertension so fundoscopy and imaging are recommended in these cases uh, for spinal csf leaks mri brain may show pachymeningeal thickening with contrast enhancement subdural fluid collections sagging of the brain mr of the mri of the spine can reveal dural collapse and csf leak ct myelography or mr myelography is the first line spinal imaging dynamic imaging if a patient has high flow leak if we suspect high flow leak in those cases dynamic myelography digital subtraction myelography or dynamic ct myelography may be helpful the key mri finding in spontaneous csf leaks are pachymeningeal enhancement subdural fluid accumulation venous engorgement and pituitary hyperemia so the key takeaways for evaluating the csf leaks are beta 2 transferrin it is a gold standard for confirming the csf leak hrct is the first line imaging then advanced imaging or mri ct myelography intracranial hypotension can be detected by mri brain or the spine coming to the management of the csf leak first is the conservative treatment it is done for small and mild leaks patient is, is advised bed rest it reduces the pressure and allows the healing hydration plays a important role adequate fluid intake helps maintain the csf volume for pain pain management we can give non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen or acetaminophen for headaches we have to restrict the caffeine it may worsen the symptoms so should be avoided positioning is very important important we have to advise the patient to avoid the activities that increases the intracranial pressure like coughing sneezing straining semi sitting position that is at 45 degree angle is preferred we have to advise him to avoid bending and forward avoid bending forward and straining in some cases we can give acetazolamide it reduces the csf production it is given as 500 mg bd for a week 
then we can give 250 mg BD. If we suspect meningitis in cases of skull fracture, we can start the broad spectrum antibiotics. Many cases of mild or smaller leaks, they resolve their own. We can uh, do lumbar drains for t uh, this is a temporary CSF diversion. Its indication is to lower the intracranial pressure and allow healing. Here we, cath a, we place a catheter in the lumbar region to drain the excess CSF. Epidural blood patch for persistent leak. Here we give injection of the patient's own blood that is 10 to 20 ml into the epidural space to see the leak. The success rate is more than 95% with 20 ml of blood. Indication is for refractory or the recurrent leaks. For large and refractory leaks, surgical intervention is required. We do endoscopic nasal repair. It is done for first line for skull based leaks and it uses absorbable packing like gel foam, fibrin glue. We can do ventricular peritoneal shunts for high intracranial pressure cases. External ventricular drainage reduces the CSF pressure by catheter in the brain ventricles. Bone graft, they are used for structural support to extensive skull base defects. For craniofacial trauma, we have to use the conservative approach, but we should always monitor meningeal risk or meningitis risk. Iatrogenic CSF leaks, the repair, we have to repair the surgical site, it may require multiple procedures. The differential diagnosis of the CSF rhinorrhea or the headaches or allergic rhinitis, common cold like uh, because of infectious cases, sinus diseases like sinusitis, polyps, vasomotor rhinitis, head injury contributing to post-traumatic headaches, spinal diseases, migraine, meningitis because of infection, subarachnoid hemorrhage, carotid or vertebral artery dissections, benign or spontaneous intracranial hypertension, brain tumors, they are all categorized in the differential diagnosis of CSF rhinorrhea or the headaches. Uh, Prognosis of the CSF leak, usually the CSF leaks, they carry a good prognosis. Most cases they heal successfully. Endoscopy repair success rate is 90 to 98%. Higher recurrence risk is seen in spontaneous leaks, obese patients, patients with elevated intracranial pressure and patients of empty cella syndrome. The complication of the CSF leak, as I already discussed, or meningitis, chronic low pressure headaches, neck pain, tinnitus because of meningitis. Patient may have loss of smell or taste. Few patients may develop brain abscess. Subdural hematoma is seen in 0.3% of the cases. And uh, abducent nerve palsy post surgery is rare but can be seen. Higher risk of persistent CSF leaks in untreated cases so the key takeaways are early diagnosis and repair are crucial to prevent the complications like meningitis and chronic CSF hypotension with this I conclude my today's topic sometimes the best medicine is the listening ear thank you keep learning